So I like to give an overview just because I've experienced presentations where I'm like, this is a lot, where are we going? So give you kind of a roadmap of what we'll talk about. Um, I'll introduce EcoCycle, um, talk about zero waste and climate change, um, how we measure the impact of zero waste. I'll talk about this concept of the circular economy, specifically how we see that on a local scale. Talk about recycling, talk about composting and food waste. And then uh, how to take action, because one theme that will go through this whole presentation is that I like to study and advocate for zero waste because it's something we can all do, whether it's on a small scale, uh, whether it's on a larger scale, it's actionable. So uh, who, who here in this room already knows who EcoCycle is? Show of hands. All right. Yeah, about half. Great. Um, well, I'll give a brief introduction here of who we are, what we do. Um, so... It's, it's also worth mentioning, I, I love how I get on stage and the rain starts happening and the thunder starts rolling. It gives an ominous uh, vibe here, but um, I'm a pretty friendly, smiley guy, so I think it'll be, it'll be fun. I'm glad for the moisture. Anyway, back to where, what we were talking about, EcoCycle. So EcoCycle um, brought recycling to Colorado in 1976. We were the very first curbside recycling organization. And what we did, it was all volunteers when we started, and we bought an old school bus and it ripped off the back door and drove around the city of Boulder collecting uh, recyclables on the curbside. And from there, we have grown into where we are today, and that includes um, operating the Boulder County Recycling Center. So that is the big recycling sorting facility um, that I noticed I didn't say we don't own the Boulder County Recycling Center. That is a publicly owned facility that we've been operating for 20 years. We also own and operate the Center for Hard to Recycle Materials. It's a first in the nation type facility. It's a drop off center for hard to recycle materials. So we recycle bikes and books and toilets and um, Christmas lights and all sorts of weird things. If we find a way to recycle it, we're going to recycle it there. So I've got a bit more on hard recycle materials later. Um, we also have a, an, an education department of about a dozen staff members who go to over 50 schools a year and teach kids about zero waste. Um, and for me, I mean, my introduction into environmental issues as a young kid was learning about reduce, reuse, recycle. And to no surprise, teaching kids, whether they're kindergartners or seniors in high school and everything in between, um, teaching kids about zero waste and how it's actionable and how these systems work, it pays off in the long run. And one quick example of that is one of the EcoCycle kids that we taught in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, grew up and is now first gentleman Marlon Reese. So sometimes we help him with uh, Facebook posts for recycling tips. Um, but that's just one example of how environmental education pays off in the long run. And uh, I work in the small but mighty policy department. So I like to say I, I try to improve these systems um, at a policy level, and I also like to bother lawmakers and, and get them on my side and win them over. I hope I win you all over too today. To sum it up, EcoCycle really does all things zero waste. You know, if there's a communications piece or um, research project, we're, we try to stay on it. We really um, are trailblazers in this field, and want to help our partners across the country and across the world advance these zero waste systems. So here's some photos, you might have seen some of them on the first slide, but the bottom one here, this is the Boulder County Recycling Center on about 63rd in Arapahoe. If you, if you haven't been, it's open to the public on Tuesdays from nine to three. And the way this f facility was created was citizens of Boulder passed a tax on themselves to create this facility. Um, and when it was built and designed, they built it with recycled materials, um, with sustainability in mind, right, a lot of natural light. And one thing that I love about this facility that I have not seen in any other recycling facility is that it's designed to invite the public in to see with their own eyes how these different systems work. Um, I'm no expert on safety, but I've been to a lot of recycling centers and I judge a, a recycling center's um, outreach by would I want a group of kids running around here? Um, if the answer is no, um, I, I add a little point to Boulder County Recycling Center because we, we invite that. Um, in this upper left-hand picture, I, this is a, just a small snapshot of our Center for Hard to Recycle Materials. 
And among that big list of things that we recycle are mattresses. We've always got a stack of mattresses, and I'll talk about what we do with them a bit later in the presentation. And one last thing I want to show off before I keep moving on is um, we bought the nation's first fully electric compost collection vehicle. Um, so zero waste and zero emissions. Um, it's at the Conference for Cities in Denver. I forget the exact name of the conference that's going on, but um, we're bring in mayors and leaders from all over the world, and um, someone asked to drive down our electric truck to show that off. So um, try to be forward-thinking in all things zero waste. So it's good to even just start here. What is zero waste? As I mentioned, a lot of folks know reduce, reuse, recycle, and might even roll your eyes at that phrase. You've heard it so many times. But zero waste is more than that. Um, so what are some of the other things that you think about when you hear zero waste? And go ahead and shout them out. Someone said something. Vine and bulk, yeah, reusable. Um, there is so much more than reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, there is rotting through composting, right? Recycling organic material. There's repairing materials and keeping them out of the landfill and extending the life of different um, items. Um, there's redesigning and rethinking things to be built to be more sustainable, right? To be built to be uh, recyclable, because a lot of times the producers of materials don't design with recycling in mind or durability in mind, right? We've all heard that phrase, it's not built like it's used to be, and that's not just a sentiment, that's a real thing, and big companies are being sued because they're designing products to break so they can sell another one. That's not very zero waste. Uh, we want to be keeping, especially electronics, out of the landfill and extending the life there. Um, there's refusing things, right? I work in zero waste, but I still have a stack of chopsticks from takeout um, restaurants in my drawer. Um, there's repurposing materials, right? Giving things a second new life. There's regifting books or records, CDs, whatever it might be. Um, there's resiliency. I try to emphasize more of the climate and energy side of things for, for this audience. Um, there's responsibility, which I will talk about, right? Whose job is it to fix these systems, to recycle, um, etc.? And the one R that ties all these things together and all the things I will talk about are relationships. And this is a theme that I'll, I'll keep bringing up because without relationships, right? Without you all deciding to come out with questionable weather on the forecast, um, spending your evening talking to me, um, advancing zero waste, projects in your own life, at your community. Relationships really tie all these things together. So let's talk climate a little bit to start, and then we'll branch off from there. And I love this quote. I pulled this from the Blueprint for a Safer Planet uh, by the economist uh, Nicholas Stern. He says that recycling is already making a major contribution to keeping down emissions. Instead, uh, indeed, it scales so little appreciated that it might be described as one of the best kept secrets in energy and climate. Um, and he uses the term recycling there, but really we could apply these to the greater systems, right? Uh, composting, repairing, etc. Um, it's a way of looking at our material economy. So a few ways that um, zero waste is a climate solution include saving energy, in the remanufacturing process, and that includes saving resources, right? Um, reducing landfill emissions, which I'll talk about in a little bit here, um, and also storing carbon in the soil through composting. Compost helps improve soils that uh, grow healthier plants that can sequester more carbon. There's been a lot of exciting research in that field. So, um, Let's think about waste and climate change, just to get oriented here. Um, one statistic that I pulled from EPA's waste reduction model, the abbreviation is WARM, and I always want to say WARM model, but the M stands for model. But this is EPA's free public tool to calculate what are the energy savings of recycling, of composting, of uh, burning our trash. And one, one place to orient ourselves is that they say, for every one ton of recycled material, and this is recycled material in the broadest terms, right? Things that are picked up from your curbside and collected and averaged, so 
let's say, one ton of recycled material of cardboard and glass and aluminum and paper, that one ton saves an average of three tons of greenhouse gas emissions upstream. So that's what I mean when I say zero waste is a climate solution. And I mentioned landfill methane, and this is, this is a piece I mentioned earlier that zero waste is actionable, and this is a place that we can really crack down on methane emissions, which I'm sure everyone here in this room knows it, is a powerful greenhouse gas. It's 84 times as powerful as carbon dioxide. Um, you might see a spectrum of that number of how, how much more powerful methane is than carbon dioxide um, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, but in the short term, it's 84 times as powerful. And landfills emit uh, just over 17% of total methane in the United States. Uh, the first two leading sources being oil and gas, no surprise, and um, uh, agriculture, livestock, mainly from cows. Um, but this landfill piece, this is something that we can do in our homes, in our place of worship or business. Um, and not only, I'll, I'll get into it a little bit later, but not only are there benefits of reducing methane emissions from landfills, there's benefits of using that material in a more productive way. Um, I love this graph. I pulled this from the International Scrap Recycling Institute, and it shows how much energy is saved for different materials um, when they are recycled compared to when they are manufactured using virgin resources. And um, you'll notice that metals are at the top of this list. Plastic is a big, broad category. Um, but let's look at metals and kind of think about, let, let's take the humble aluminum can as an example. And this could be applied to paper, steel, glass, whatever. But let's think about the aluminum can, right? What goes into creating that aluminum can? Uh, where does it come from? Well, I'll tell you that aluminum, I'm sorry? Oh, <laughs> I, um, I, I did a presentation early, like a few weeks ago, and I had a similar mic that just kept going off my face. So I'm, I'm uh, very aware of someone saying, your mic's getting away. So that's, that's what I thought that was. Um, but back to the aluminum, right? Uh, where does aluminum come from? Uh, I'll tell you that it's mined um, in the global south, mostly in South America, but also some in Australia, um, right? Clear-cutting rainforests to mine uh, bauxite ore. That's the, the raw material. That bauxite ore is mostly refined in Iceland. So we're shipping bauxite ore to Iceland to refine bauxite into raw aluminum, these big, big old blocks. From there, um, the aluminum is shipped all over the world. Um, but of course, we have a, a lot of aluminum right here in Colorado, right? We've got a lot of excellent local craft breweries. So that aluminum comes uh, all across the world, let's say Colorado, and might get rolled out into hundreds of thousands of millions of aluminum cans that can be filled up, again, with their favorite local Colorado craft beer. Um, enjoy that beer. I'm going to after the, this presentation. Um, and then you have a choice, right? Um, that aluminum could, its life could end when you put it in a trash can and it can be buried in a landfill, which is a graveyard of resources. Or you could recycle that aluminum can and shortcut that whole process. Instead of all that mining, etc. You're putting it back into the local economy. It's circulating in a local circular economy um, and saving all the energy and necess necessity to go to create that um, aluminum. So think about that concept and how it applies to all the materials in our life. Um, so I mentioned it takes 92% uh, less energy to create an aluminum can from a recycled aluminum compared to uh, the mining, refining, shipping across the world model. Um, and again, according to EPA's waste reduction model, WARM, um, just recycling one aluminum can saves enough energy to power a computer for five hours. Um, that's one that I love to drop at parties, a short one. Um, if anyone's taking notes, make a little, little one of that. That, um, you know, that this impact, while it might seem small on the individual level, really does add up. You know, we think about um, all the excellent Colorado craft breweries, and uh, when we recycle them, those, uh, that energy save really adds up. And on top of that, that's creating a local resilient supply chain, right? We've, we're keeping the aluminum circulating here because we all felt it during the pandemic that when we rely on these big, long supply chains, when something gets disrupted, um, we feel that all throughout the rest of the supply chain. So we can keep that material circulating domestically. 
All right, pop quiz. I don't know if Martin told you all, but uh, do some, some uh, homework before presentation, but we'll take a, a guess here. And if, if you know this one from EcoCycle's emails, uh, we'll wait. But um, the national waste diversion rate, um, so recycling and composting as compared to what gets buried in a landfill or incinerated, is about 32%. That's a big, broad, admittedly a little fuzzy number of how we estimate um, waste in America. Does anyone want to take a guess on how we're doing here in Colorado? 27. 27? 27, going once, going twice. Who's got another number? 40? 15 percent in Colorado. <laughs> yeah, boo! Well, I'll tell you, I've been staring at this number for a little over two years since I got into this field. Um, but, and it's easy to think, well, wow, you know, we, we do so many great environmental things in Colorado with, with energy, with our open space and conservation. Uh, how is it that we have such a low waste diversion rate? Um, but this number does not bum me out. What this number, what I, what I see when I think of this number is an opportunity, an opportunity to grow, to teach others, to build those relationships and save resources and energy and reduce pollution as we do it. So I, this number to me is an opportunity to grow. And I uh, think we have all the tools to do it. I see you're taking a photo here. So I'll wait till you take your photo before going to this next slide. All right, cool. All right, so I talked a little bit about measuring the impact of waste, and I want to expand on that a little bit more here. Do, I, do we have any NREL scientists here tonight? No? Whew. All right. <laughs> I we do have one. All right. Um, <laughs> I, I told my wife that, and she's like, oh, you're going to Golden for a, a renewable energy thing. You, might, you should practice your presentation because there might be scientists there. But <laughs> this, this one's for you. I wanted to include some more um, information on how these different systems are measured and really dig in for this audience. So the EPA came out with this waste reduction model. Um, I think it first came out in 98 or 99, pretty... Um, primitive at the time, and it's moved on to be the uh, 15th version, and they continue to improve it. Um, as you know, I think it's safe to say in this uh, room of folks who are interested in renewable energy that you know, science in our systems are self-correcting and continuously improve. Um, so what this model is, it's a free downloadable Excel spreadsheet um, that is used to calculate and estimate the greenhouse gas emissions saved through um, not just recycling, composting, or waste reduction, but um, through a, several different waste management um, systems. So the way they do that, they include 60 different types of materials. Um, so everything from what might go into your curbside bin to more industrial projects, right? Um, I, I live in Denver, so I have the Dem Denver numbers at the top of my head, but the residential waste, the um, curbside bins, only makes up about 18% of Denver's overall waste. The other 82% is mostly um, larger apartment buildings and businesses and construction and demolition sites. So what this tool does as it's grown and become um, better, more accurate, is compares the different uh, tonnage and gives you numbers of, of the impact. Um, I also want to mention, as I've used this tool, I um, want to stress that this is an estimation, it's not true accounting. And I also take issue that they count um, landfilling as carbon storage. And um, yeah, <laughs> I think it's pretty funny too, you know, if I went and landfilled a bunch of trees, could I write that off as carbon storage? I, I don't think so. But, but here, here's what, Yeah, that is a growing technology, and um, I'll mention that the Denver Arapaho disposal site um, in um, southeast Aurora um, has methane capture technology. Um, it's not perfect. The numbers I hear is that they can capture about up to 30%, um, depending on who you ask, right? Um, it's not perfect. I want that to improve. I'm an all-hands-on-deck kind of guy when it comes to improving these systems. Um, and I should mention, too, that I think for the sake of audio, of questions, um, normally I like to sit in a circle and we can have more of a discussion than presentation, but um, uh, Martin asked if we could hold questions till the end so we could pick them up on the microphone. 
Um, but back to EPA's warm, I wanted to include this, and um, it might be hard to see it, but I went in and plugged numbers for what's the difference between recycling one ton of aluminum cans versus landfilling one ton of aluminum cans. And they will give you um, whatever calculation numbers you put in, um, they'll give you this, a similar output. So one ton of recycling aluminum versus one ton of landfilling aluminum saves um, just under five metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Um, and for each, every time you calculate it, it gives you these different um, comparisons. That's about the uh, total annual emissions of one passenger vehicle. Um, it's equal to conserving 542 gallons of gasoline and bless the person at the EPA who insisted on putting this into every <laughs> calculation, but that's also equal to conserving 200 cylinders of propane used for home barbecues. Get that uh, propane used for home barbecues on every calculation I do. Um, all right, moving on a little bit to um, a concept called consumption emissions. Um, and I'll put a caveat that, oops, that I'm not... I'm, I'm versed in this subject, but I can't get into the nitty-gritty of, of consumption emissions. Um, I can say that, according to EPA, that 42% um, of all greenhouse gas emissions are how we uh, produce, consume, and dispose of our stuff and food, um, our built economy and our organic economy, right, uh, including food waste here. So that's looking at the whole pie here. They estimate that about 42% of total emissions are from our stuff. Um, and again, this zero waste concept, it's, we're not just looking at the recycling and landfilling, it's looking at the larger systems here, right? Reducing waste, um, repurposing materials, giving, uh, making the most of Earth's finite resources. And a problem with uh, consumption emissions is that they're often left out of um, greenhouse gas inventories. So my understanding is that climate accounting is based on geographic boundaries, kind of um, put a bubble around uh, a city and account what's going on in the city, but that doesn't capture everything. It doesn't capture the consumption of things that are um, made elsewhere, um, which agriculture and food is an enormous piece of that pie. Um, and also air travel is somehow left out of that. So we're not capturing the full picture here. And I um, pulled this next graphic from Portland, Oregon, which I think is about the best graphic I could find to illustrate this point. And I realize some of the text is small here, um, but this, this red sliver is, is waste and, and that, that's, um, let's see. And, and they provide some numbers for, for Portland, Oregon. They're the, the first community to account for consumption emissions. Um, the sector-based economy is this, this smaller circle here and the larger circle, circle is consumption emissions. So that's everything outside coming in. So they take a more holistic approach um, of studying the environmental impact of our stuff. So Martin asked me to address this one um, about waste incineration, right? Why not burn all of our waste? Now I'll give you a, a quick list of uh, ideas. Um, I think for a lot of these different topics, I could spend the whole hour talking just about waste incineration or just about recycling, but I want to try to hit as many different topics as I can here. So, so why not burn all of our waste? Um, the quick one that maybe the most important one is that um, it's expensive and polluting, right? Why build more waste incinerators when there are better energy solutions out there? Uh, I think I'm literally preaching to the choir as I stand up here <laughs> and, and say that. Um, but when we think of burning our waste, um, let's I like to use the metaphor of a campfire, right? To keep a campfire burning, to keep that energy coming off of it, you need to keep feeding it um, logs. And that's the same case for waste incinerators. Um, it's not something where you can just turn off the lights or flip a switch at the end of the day and go home and um, turn it back on tomorrow. That takes a lot of startup energy to get that started. They constantly need a feedstock of waste coming in, um, burning that waste, which again is expensive, and polluting, and, and you just need to keep feeding it to keep it going. So that's, that's not a sustainable way of managing Earth's finite resources. Um, another thing that when we just 
burn it all away is that there's no, like landfilling, there's no incentive for designing our materials to be more durable, more sustainable, uh, or recyclable, right? Because the things that um, waste incinerators really want, the things that um, burn fast and hot, are plastics. And burning plastics is just a roundabout way of um, continuing the path that we're on with fossil fuels, right? Um, you know, of course, they're made into something. Plastics are derived from oil and gas, but to go and burn them, um, that's not a solution to the plastic pollution crisis. I'll, I'll talk about plastic a little bit later. Really, the, the solution there is to reduce the amount of plastics we're dealing with in the first place. Um, and unfortunately, it should come as no surprise, but waste incineration creates a lot of environmental justice concerns. Um, I included uh, two leading organizations on this issue, and Energy Justice Network has really um, done a lot showing, you know, where are these waste incinerators that are um, polluting, uh, where, where are they located? And they tend to be in uh, historically marginalized communities. Um, there's a great documentary about the waste incinerator in Newark, New Jersey, um, which, name, which uh, the name escapes me at the moment. Um, and, and finally, when we talk about burning waste, um, the plastics industry has been putting out a lot of information about so-called chemical or advanced recycling, um, which compared to traditional recycling, where materials are shred up and maybe melted down and reprocessed, um, they take this, this chemical approach of pulling apart the polymers and distilling plastics into their um, you know, chemical components. And the problem with this is that um, oftentimes, um, one, these systems have been trying to get off the ground for, for decades and they just keep proving to be um, super expensive and not very successful. And when they call it chemical or advanced recycling, they can mask the fact that a lot of that byproduct of chemical recycling is just burned to power that facility. So it's a, it's a similar thing to the incineration. Um, that's, that's a big fight and hot topic in, in recycling today. Um, I stuck this graph in maybe 10 minutes before I left for Golden. Um, this is from Energy Justice Network, and I realized that the text is too small to read, but it's to highlight at least their calculations of the environmental and economic costs of incinerating compared to landfilling. Um, there's a misconception that um, landfills are, are filling up, and that's the main reason to recycle. Um, that is the case for some landfills, especially like in, in Europe, where there's not a lot of land available. But um, at least in the American West, there is a lot of room in landfills. Um, really, it's more about, and you'll, someone keep count of all the times I say, making the most of Earth, Earth's finite resources, but it's more about diverting that material and making um, the most of it, the highest and best use of our plastics and cardboard and metals. So I, I think that that incineration piece, and I talked a bit about landfilling, um, that is our, how we've been doing things, right? The linear economy where we take resources from the earth, we make it into all sorts of stuff, um, and then dispose of it when it breaks or looks ugly and old or um, whatever the cause might be. It goes to a landfill and that's that. That is the end of the life for that material. But we can contrast that with a model called the circular economy, um, which again is more than just recycling, but it's a shortcut to cut put that material back into the economy, um, ideally on a local scale, because it wouldn't make sense to be um, circulating this mat these materials but shipping them halfway around the world, right? We want to um, capture this material um, here and make the most of it here. Oops. So I want to talk a little bit about the uh, economic impact of Recycling again. I, I'm using this term. But I should really zoom out. That this this includes um, composting and repairing things and reuse. And one institute, the Telus Institute, um, crunched the numbers, the the amount of labor, um, and came up with a figure that um, recycling and, and related systems can create and sustain up to um, nine times the number of jobs compared to landfilling. Um, I, I want to emphasize up to that number. It's not a magical thing where 
Um, you create a re recycling system and then boom, that's nine times as many jobs. Um, this, is, this is, it can get up to that many um, jobs. More, more labor goes into managing these materials, sorting them um, into the robots that sort recycling, et cetera. Um, and I, again, I'm bringing the numbers from EPA here. They um, did a study in 2020 and looked at numbers from 2012. So these are the numbers I'm going to read off you. These are the most recent um, that these recycling and reuse systems um, maintain 681,000 jobs in the United States, and I am one of those jobs. Um, $37.8 billion in wages, and I am $0.8 billion of those wages. Um, and uh, up to $5.5 billion in tax revenue, um, which is nothing to shrug at, especially considering that this, these numbers were taken from a decade ago. And we look back at that uh, Colorado figure of around 15%, and we've got so much more room to grow. Um, and as we grow and create what we call green collar jobs here, um, we're keeping material out of the landfill and trying to pave a more sustainable path forward, right? It's good to pause for a second and emphasize that I'm not advocating for recycling for recycling's sake. I'm advocating for recycling as a means to an end of slowing the detrimental effects of human-caused climate change and to um, be sustainable in our resource management. Um, simply put, zooming out, the more material we can capture and remanufacture, the more sustainable jobs we can support. And I want to give some local examples too, right? Get out of a theoretical era, area and the numbers and talk about right here in the front range and use glass as an example. So we're lucky here. A lot of communities don't recycle glass because it's heavy. Obviously, it um, can break and cut people. But here in Colorado, we want glass. And the reason is um, we have a glass recycling facility, um, glass to glass, formerly called Momentum Recycling in Broomfield. And they take glass from the recycling sorting facilities, right? All your curbside recycling, it goes to a facility that just sorts it, right? The recycling doesn't really go on, go uh, happen at the um, recycling sorting facility, um, or you might hear it called a MRF, a materials recovery facility. Those are what we think of like the Boulder County Recycling Center where materials are sorted. So we, um, here in the front range, it makes sense to sort out that glass and send it to glass to glass where they clean it up, right? Wash it, um, break it down into tiny pieces of what they call cutlet, right? You see a bare hand there holding a pile of broken glass um, I wouldn't do that myself, but um, it, it shows that it, it's turning this material into a feedstock uh, locally. And of course, we've got um, two big bottlers here in the front range. We've got um, Rocky Mountain Bottling Company uh, just down the street and um, Owens, Illinois Bottling Company, which is up in Windsor. And they want more glass. I um, was talking to a gentleman who works there and he told me that they import glass, uh, recycled glass from other states because um, they make so many bottles um, that they, they need to import it. And they, maybe they would need to keep importing it, um, but if we just recycled more in the front range, uh, that would be supporting, again, the folks who pick up your recycling, the folks who sort your recycling, folks who work at glass to glass, and the uh, bottling companies. Um, that whole circle there, just by recycling, um, you're supporting their jobs and keeping this valuable material out of the landfill. That's a shining example of a local circular economy. And I want to highlight two more that are um, thinking a little bit outside the bin, right? Um, and the first one I like to highlight is one called Springback Colorado, located in Commerce City. And the Springback is a play on words. One in the sense that they recycle mattresses, right? They disassemble them and uh, can recycle the springs as scrap metal, um, but it's also spring back in the sense that they hire folks who are coming out of incarceration or recovering from addiction or have some other barrier to employment. Um, and they say, yeah, we'll hire you. We want to hire you to give you a job um, recycling this material. So it's springing back lives. And has anyone here ever toured a landfill? Maybe a few, yeah, Martin has. Excellent. Um, if, if you all do, and I, I highly recommend it, you know, you'll never forget driving up a literal mountain of trash. Um, but there are a ton of mattresses there. They take up a lot of room. Um, I don't know how we blow through 
so many mattresses in the U US. Um, but again, that's a shining example of it. You can dump it at the landfill, which is not free, by the way, or you could recycle it with this company, which is also not free, but when you recycle it with them, you are supporting someone who needs a job. Um, and the same is true with an excellent organization called Blue Star Recyclers um, that EcoCycle uh, works with on site at our Center for Hard to Recycle Materials. And it's a similar concept, but uh, Blue Star Recyclers hires folks um, on the autism spectrum. And a lot goes into our electronic waste. They um, disassemble all sorts of old computers, uh, VCR players, etc., and sort these different valuable materials, right? I'm sure um, we've all um, seen pictures of lithium mining for batteries, but there's lithium batteries in just about everything. And I'll tell you, I, I toured a recycling facility in the landfill just two weeks ago, and at the landfill, they told me that uh, once a week, they get a fire because of a battery. And a fire at a landfill is not a pretty thing. Um, and similarly, you know, a phone or whatever might end up in a recycling bin. And what else is in a recycling bin, right? A lot of paper, a lot of plastic, also not a good fit. Um, so recycle your electronics with Blue Star Recyclers. They're an awesome organization. They have the highest social and environmental um, certifications. Um, so I think that these are two shining good examples of how local circular economies um, work and why we should support them. All right, plastics. Um, again, this is one thing that if, if you just let me go, we'd be here till midnight and uh, you'd hear all about plastics. Well, I'll keep it kind of high level. And if you want to learn more about plastics, of course, there's Q&A afterwards and I'll hang out with my favorite local Colorado craft brew. Um, but plastic recycling is confusing. And one way to start with this is by mentioning that this symbol here, right, what we call the chasing arrows recycling symbol, which is one of the most globally recognized symbols, is not regulated in the United States. This does not mean that something is recyclable, especially not with plastics. This symbol was created um, as a design competition in the um, plastic recycling industry. And what this symbol does, which is very misleading, right? We all know this as the recycling symbol and we check to see if a product has the symbol on it to see if it's recyclable. But they say, oh, no, 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 that's just to identify the type of plastic, right? The resin identification code, as they call it. So um, what we like to do at EcoCycle, again, we operate the Boulder County Recycling Center. When we talk to folks about what kind of plastics are recyclable in your curbside bin, right, traditional recycling, um, we say, let's not focus on the numbers too much. I can tell you what the numbers are, if you'd like to know, and the ins and outs of them later. But let's not focus on the numbers too much, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Let's focus on the shape of the plastic. So we like to say that we recycle, and this is true in the uh, uh, North Denver, uh, they have two recycling facilities, that they're really trying to collect bottles, tubs, jugs, and jars. And when they hired me at EcoCycle, they're like, okay, Say this three times out loud. Don't forget it. This is, this is the key to plastics recycling. Bottles, tubs, jugs, and jars. And they had me say it again. Bottles, tubs, jugs, and jars. Um, and the reason why we say recycle these types of plastics is um, twofold. One of them is that they tend to be the higher quality, um, more economically viable types of plastics. Um, and two, it's how plastics are, resort are sorted at recycling facilities. So I don't expect the general public to know this at all, which is why I'd like to get up in front of folks and talk about this, is that the way plastics are sorted at recycling facilities are mainly using robots. And what robots are doing, they're not looking at a container and saying, is that a seven or a one? Can you, can you say that? I, we have all done that, right? Robots don't have time for that. Things are moving faster at a recycling facility. The robot's using an AI camera. They're looking at it and saying, okay, what shape is that plastic? Is it a bottle, tub, jug, or jar? Because those are um, economically viable, valuable plastics. And if I recognize that shape, um, I'm gonna grab it and put it over here with all the other tubs. And there are um, two types of robot systems that, that do that. One of them I like to highlight is a Louisville-based company called Amp Robotics. And we've all seen, like, um, like at arcades, those little claw machines, right, that never quite pick up <laughs> your teddy bear or whatever. Imagine a really fast version of that, but instead of a claw, there's a little sucker on it. 
And again, there's an AI robot looking at these different types of packaging coming in, and they're, they're sorting really quickly, and um, they're learning what, what is coming into facilities, and they're saying, okay, well, this, I know this one, or this is a new one, but this is recyclable, and that's not just one facility, that's all the robots um, in the country, and really in the world, um, AMP, AMP Robotics is uh, global, they're all talking to each other and identifying these valuable types of plastics that can be sor sorted. So that's why I try to emphasize bottles, tubs, jugs, and jars, and not the numbers so much. A little bit more about plastics. Um, many of us probably saw that um, in the fall of last year, um, Greenpeace put out a very good, strong report on the shortcomings of plastic recycling. Now, unfortunately, um, media picked up this report and misconstrued some of the numbers. So you might have heard the figure um, that only between 5 and 10% of plastics are recycled, right? We probably heard 6, maybe 7, 9. Numbers fluctuate. Um, but what that gets translated to is, um, you think about the types of plastics that are in your recycling bin, does that mean only 5 to 10% of the plastics that I put in my bin get recycled? And that's not the case. That's not what the Greenpeace report said. What it said is that there's a lot of plastic in the world. There's more than ever before. It's been growing exponentially. A lot of that plastic that was created was never designed to be recyclable, right? Unlike a glass bottle or aluminum can, there's a lot of uh, nuance in different types of plastics, right? I just shared how they're sorted. Um, but there are plastics in our clothing, in chairs, in carpets, um, in your dashboard of your car. Um, there's a lot of plastic in the world. About 40% of the plastic is consumer packaged goods, which um, industry is doing a better job of recycling, designing for recyclability now. Um, but what that report says is that they're estimating that all the plastic that's been created and is in existence now, only this small sliver has been recycled. And I agree, that's not acceptable. We can grow those numbers through education, better programs, but what what they end on and what EcoCycle firmly agrees with as an organization that recycles plastics is that we're not going to recycle our way out of the plastic pollution crisis. And plastic pollution is on the minds of a lot of folks. Um, it is for me. That's one of the reasons why I got into this field. Um, the answer to the plastic pollution crisis is to reduce plastic, right? We think about if you have a bathtub that's overflowing, um, you don't want to just be spooning out that water or um, putting in a bucket just to put back in the tub, right? You want to turn off the tap to address that problem. Um, and just a little asterisk that we like to put on on top of that Greenpeace report is that certain pl plastics can and are recycled. Um, and for folks who have doubts about it because of this or because of whatever research, I always offer folks to come and see for yourself, right? I mentioned the Boulder County Recycling Center is open to the public 9 to 3 every Tuesday. Um, and we're not just sorting and packaging up what we call bales, right, about a three by three by three cube of recycled material. We're not just doing that for show to, right, just dump in the ocean or whatever, burn it, put it in the landfill. Um, that is a key part of the recycling economy. So certain plastics, again, bottles, tubs, jugs, and jars can be recycled, um, but the solution is to reduce plastics. I talked a little bit about what can be recycled, but people also want to know what should not be recycled. And if you go to any recycling facility in North America and ask them what the biggest problem they have is, they'll say, plastic bags. Um, and this is why. Have, it, have you ever been vacuuming around you know, maybe the front of your house and you vacuum up a shoelace and it gets caught up in there? That is the same thing on an industrial scale with plastic films of all sorts. So we mentioned plastic bags, but there's all sorts of thin films from packaging, from uh, shipping, and, and we need to reduce that amount of plastic because it just keeps coming in. There are a lot of conveyor belts, heavy machinery, robots, and people working at these recycling facilities. And when too many plastic bags get caught up in, um, you know what, let's take this type of sorter, um, they need to turn everything off, go in and cut all the plastic out. Um, and not to make any money on that. So, so keep plastic films of all sorts out of your curbside recycling bin. But the other thing that we should um, keep out of recycling facilities, especially in the summer, are food and liquids. And I think what gets lost is that um, 
it's easy to forget um, that there are people working in those facilities, you know, collecting your recycling and taking them and sorting them and eventually trying to sell them. Um, when it's 95 degrees and you got a um, half a cheeseburger that's been sitting in your recycling bin for a week, that it can attract um, hornets and molds and we, we just want to keep that stuff out mainly for sa uh, worker safety uh, but secondly um, because cleaner recyclables are more valuable when you resell them. I've got a lot of cute graphics in this uh, presentation but I love this sparkling recycling bin. Uh, the cleaner your recyclables are, um, the more valuable they'll be um, when they get recycled. And someone always asks us, how clean is clean, right? Um, and I say that it doesn't need to be spotless clean at all, right? Uh, but it should at least be empty, right? So if you have a pasta jar, a pasta sauce jar, put a little shot of water in there, put the lid back on and shake it up, that should be fine. We just ask that things be empty. Um, Martin also asked me to talk about this groundbreaking law that was passed last year that um, EcoCycle was the lead author and proponent on, but again, it took a whole coalition um, of statewide organizations uh, to pass this bill. And what it is, it's called Producer Responsibility, House Bill 22-1355. And this concept of producer responsibility, um, right, I listed out my R's at the beginning of the um, presentation, and I mentioned res responsibility, right? Whose job is it to um, manage all this packaging? And what this, and the short answer of, of how it has been in at least the United States is it's been on people who subscribe to recycling services and also taxpayers, right? If you have a uh, state or, or a municipal um, program, then you know, the, you're paying as the individual, you're paying for recycling. And what this bill does, what this concept does, is that it puts the cost of recycling back onto the producer who's making all this packaging in the first place. Now, I'm sure an alarm went off in most of your heads saying, well, doesn't that roll ca costs back onto the individual, onto the consumer? And based on over 40 years of programs in Canada and across Europe, the answer is not really. Um, the, the way that producers pay for recycling for all of us, for Coloradans, um, or whatever system it might be, is for each piece of packaging that they sell into Colorado, whether it's a cardboard box, aluminum can, uh, styrofoam, there is a small um, fee attached to that piece of packaging. Um, and I should mention that this just applies to the larger producers, right? The big beverage companies, the uh, um, enormous delivery wholesaler. Um, so they pay fractions of a fractions of a penny, um, as we've seen in, again, Canada and Europe, who've been doing these systems for a long time. They pay a, a tiny amount based on the amount of packaging they sell into Colorado. That pools up into a pot of money, and the producers who make this um, type of packaging manage that pot of money and use that to expand and advance recycling systems statewide. Um, so if you're thinking about the, the fee of that, there's a, a really cool feature built into this policy model that um, has been used and has been proven to work, and that's something called eco-modulation. Um, and what that does is it incentivizes the producer of packaging to design for um, recyclability in mind or for sustainability in mind. So I mentioned how much I love aluminum. Uh, cardboard's also a very recyclable material. That'll have a lower fee, right? There's no kind of ambiguity around those types of materials. Now, what about expanded polystyrene foam, right? Styrofoam. That is a very unsustainable material um, that to disincentivize that type of packaging, that will have a higher fee on it. Because right now, um, there isn't much of an incentive, right? We've all got the package, package that has a box wrapped inside of plastic, inside another box that's wrapped in plastic, and it's like, why is there so much packaging here? There's finally a um, policy incentive to reduce that type of packaging and use more sustainable type of packaging. Um, I should mention, too, that Colorado just became the third state to pass this type of policy. So Oregon and Maine passed similar policies in 2021. They already have advanced recycling systems. Um, they wanted 
something a little bit more. Um, we, right, 15% in Colorado, uh, not so much. So we took, um, we didn't copy and paste policy because that's not how it works. We took the best parts of all the different systems and made something that will work for Colorado. And what we've already seen is that um, over a dozen other states are working on introducing similar policies and they're looking towards our policy because it's, um, it fits states that want to grow their recycling systems more. Um, this will go, we expect it to go into effect as in start paying for your recycling bin in 2026, but there's a lot to set up to get there. So it's, this bill has been passed. Um, the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment is in the process of, well, what they've, they're moving things along, but there's still a long way to go until um, big producers, cardboard boxes and cans start paying for your recycling. Uh, statewide too, right? Because in uh, front range, more affluent communities, um, it's easier to access recycling, but that's not the case um, throughout Colorado. Um, if you want to learn more about this policy, I get, I totally understand it's a miracle to me that we managed to explain what this policy is and get people on board and get it passed last year. I get that it's complicated. If you want to learn more about this policy, go to recyclingforallcoloradans.org. That's kind of the uh, campaign hub, and you'll see letters of support from um, big packaging producers like Coca-Cola. They're a prime sponsor on this. Um, from Ball, right, with all, all their aluminum. Um, from municipal leaders uh, statewide that say, okay, this is a policy model that has proven to work and we can do it here in Colorado. All right, and I am keeping an eye on the time. Martin said, uh, take as long as you like, which uh, <laughs> I, uh, I really could be here all night. If you can't tell, I love talking about this subject. Um, but I'm going to pivot a little bit to uh, compost and food waste here. So I was talking more about materials management. Let's talk about organics recycling for a bit. And start by highlighting how much of an issue food waste is. Um, according to the Natural Resource Defense Council, they said that food, food waste um, alone every year is responsible for emissions equivalent to 37 million passenger vehicles um, every year. That is a huge chunk. And uh, additionally, according to Project Drawdown, a climate change solutions hub, um, if you sort by the most impactful climate solutions, um, reducing food waste is towards the top. Excuse me, one second. And a key word here with Project Drawdown is reduce food waste, right? Not just compost food waste, which is um, what you should do if it rots, but reducing an upstream, right? I walked us through a tour of bauxite ore and how it has a global um, supply chain, and uh, oftentimes that's the case for our food too, right? We want uh, pineapples in winter and, and, and so on. So much goes into the um, land, the labor, the water, um, a lot of times the fertilizers to grow food, to package it, to ship it across the country, across the world, to be stored, to be um, bought, right? There's you know, a real uh, pocketbook impact here. Um, to go into your fridge to what, right? To maybe rot, right, if we don't manage it properly. Um, so that is an enormous environmental impact. Um, I just looked at the statistic. Oh, I, I have it on the next slide. I've managed to put it in today. Um, an average family of four spends about $1,800 a year on food that they don't eat. Um, when I talk about zero waste being actionable, this is a shining example of how if we take different measures to reduce food waste at, at home, which is where the majority of food waste happens, but also at restaurants and at institutions, um, not only is it reducing that environmental impact, which we established earlier, that's going to save a lot of money too. Um, also, according to the Natural Resource Defense Council, we waste about 40% of the food that we make in the United States, which is a ridiculous number um, that I hope can only go down, one by um, telling folks who are interested about this topic, um, but more importantly, by doing something about it. Um, I should mention, too, this is from the Denver Department of Public Health and the Environment, and they just, just earlier this week launched this Food Matters um, Food Waste Prevention 
um, program, which I, I know the woman in charge of that, and she's a rock star and really rooting for that effort. And I hope that other communities can just go on their website and steal some of this valuable information to communicate this issue. All right, so let's say the food does get wasted. Uh, then what? Um, big fan of composting. And I, again, this is one of those topics that I could talk and talk and talk about, but I'll keep it high level. So when we compost our food instead of bury it in a landfill, um, that breaks down, right, as it would in nature. Um, there's no waste in nature, right? It's uh, waste, uh, our concept is kind of an, a human concept. Um, so we try to mimic nature and recycle these resources um, through whether it's backyard or industrial scale composting. And when that compost is finished, after it's um, heated up and transformed into a finished compost product, um, it can be applied to soils that um, do a host of benefits. So they, um, compost is, and, and our soils are alive, or at least they should be. And when you apply compost, there's all sorts of beneficial micro and macro nutrients to help bring the, that dead dirt back into healthy soils that um, can retain more water, right? We, it's raining right now, and we'll probably see a lot of runoff um, because our soils aren't used to it or they're not healthy and they just don't hold that water in. So uh, composting helps soils retain water. Um, it also helps grow more nutritious crops, and this is something that you can do a a backyard um, science experiment if you want. Add compost to part of your yard and not to the other, and you'll see that that is, um, it creates more nutrient-dense crops. Um, and I mentioned a little bit earlier about uh, methane emissions from landfills that are mo mainly from food scraps and yard waste that can be up to 50% of what we put in our landfills. Um, not only are we avoiding those methane emissions from the landfill, but when it's properly composted, it helps restore those soils and bring along all those environmental benefits. Um, one really cool organization um, in Marin County, just north of San Francisco, called the Marin Carbon Project, is uh, measuring the climate impact of composting. And I pulled this statistic. They say that applying less than a half inch of compost to 5% of California's rangelands, California's a big state, I don't know what that translates to in acreage, but if you apply compost to 5% of their rangelands, um, that would help plants grow that can sequester um, 28 million tons of carbon from the atmosphere, which is the equivalent of taking 6 million cars off the road. So again, I get excited about this because there's so much opportunity to reduce carbon emissions um, simply by diverting our food scraps and yard waste. Um, and you'll notice I just said those two categories, and um, you might be familiar with new guidelines on what is acceptable in composting. Um, so it might have been that, or it was the case that um, the Front Range's largest industrial composter, A1 Organics, would take, um, you know, greasy cardboard pizza boxes and certified compostable products and paper towels. And the problem they encountered is that they were getting so many products that were um, plastic or look-like products um, that they really hit the brakes and did what other industrial composters have done that have dealt with this contamination issue. And they revised their guidelines to um, just say, we just want food scraps and yard trimmings. Um, excuse me. Um, food scraps and yard trimmings, um, like in nature, that's the most valuable type of material to make a more valuable compost in the end. And by reducing what they accept, that reduces confusion and they can have a cleaner pile. And this is the first time I've included the next two slides because I can talk about this in abstract, but I think the most impactful thing is to see what they mean by that. And here's a picture and um, you'll notice there are a lot of like green bags and things that look like they should be compostable. The problem with that, and I'll get into this a little bit later, is that um, like regulating this symbol, there are no laws on the books to say whether or not something is compostable or not. Um, a lot of companies are saying, yeah, our product's plant-based or biodegradable, or they might even say that this is compostable. Um, but they didn't check with A1 Organics, right? 
Um, Colorado has a unique dry climate. Um, and the products that they someday are hopefully just willing to take will be certified by a company that says, yes, we tested your project, product. It doesn't contain plastics or PFAS and actually breaks down in compost systems. This is actually compostable. Uh, that doesn't exist yet. Um, so you end up with piles that look like this. They're full of really garbage. When a healthy finished compost pile should look like this with the sun beating down on it. It's a beautiful compost pile. Um, full disclosure, I'm taking the Denver Urban Gardens has a master composter program that is excellent. And you learn the ins and outs and science of compost, but it, it really is an amazing thing to do, right? Again, zero waste is actionable. Um, and we have so much room to grow on this front. So I've been... Perfect, yep. Um, so again, going back to that theme of, you know, we, we can do something with this, right? This isn't just abstract. I like explaining the systems behind um, waste because for so many of us, this is a problem that's out of sight and out of mind. Um, but some simple ways that you can take action in your own home is to um, make some swaps for more sustainable materials, uh, for more durable materials that reduce waste. And if you look at your trash or recycling bin, you'll see that most of that waste from a household is coming from the kitchen. A lot of food packaging um, and food. So that, that's a good place to start is, you know, take a more critical eye at your recycling bin. Is this packaging type? I, I think it's recyclable, but I've just been putting it here, but I don't really know. Um, that's where you can take action and really see if this will get processed. Um, you can start composting, right? A lot of um, haulers are starting to roll out a third bin where you can put in your um, yard waste and food scraps. Um, or you can also compost in your backyard. I, I like to say that every healthy garden should have a healthy compost pile recirculating that. Um, it's finally spring, and I love doing litter cleanup events. Uh, that's a great thing to do to bring out the community, uh, to involve kids, and have a noticeable impact, right? Spend an hour on a local park uh, picking up litter, right? Because we spend so much time avoiding it. But once you take a look, you'll see that litter is everywhere. And if you get a group of friends out, um, or you can do it by yourself, it's more fun with a group of friends, um, you can really make an impact in just an hour. So that's something you can do. You can join or create an organization. Um, EcoCycle is a volunteer network. And you can support zero waste policies, which I'll talk about in a slide here. So as I mentioned, volunteers are the backbone of how EcoCycle came to be what it is. We would be nothing without the folks who um, aren't and don't need to be experts on this topic, but they care, right? That's really, I'll, I'll never forget someone told me that sentiment and that, that really changed um, how I think about pro-environmental behaviors. Um, you can either sign up, I've got my notebook, or go on ecocycle.org if you want to um, become a volunteer and be kind of in the inner circle or just sign up for updates. Um, there's no time commitment, but we like to, you know, get to know people who sign up and establish that relationship, right? Um, but it's um, our volunteer circles. So that's one thing you can do. And you can support policy. Um, we've got two bills in the state legislature right now um, with just a week left. Um, briefly, I'll say what the two are. The first one, 191, um, will direct CDPHE to... Um, build on their organics management plan to identify better strategies of keeping green stuff out of landfills. The second one, uh, 253, um, will create a uh, regulation to prevent that greenwashing, right? I mentioned those compostable products, and this bill will say, nope, if you want to sell your product in Colorado, it has to, and you say it's compostable, it has to actually be compostable. Both these bills passed out of the House committee today, um, so we're hoping for a House floor vote and um, get it signed and over with, I uh, should say over with, vic uh, signed and victorious. Um, but this is something you can do. If you get on my email list, we'll send you an email that makes it really easy to reach out to your uh, state representative. And finally, of course, for a nonprofit, um, donations help me do these types of um, presentations. Um, your gift is an investment in zero waste in the work that we do. 
Um, and if you want to learn more about the different projects we have going on, every year we put out an annual report in uh, 2022, and you can go, well, that was our most recent one, um, but you can find that at ecocycle.org. So if you have um, any questions, comments, or jokes, my email is real easy. It's ryan at ecocycle.org. And again, thank you all for coming out and taking the time to listen to me talk about a topic that I love. Thank you.